So in this bar here, if I want to put a crotchet in here, I've got a crotchet icon here. If I just press that, you see it's come up on the screen and I can move it around and put it wherever I want. If I want to do a sharp, press that and I can put it by the note and that note now is D sharp. Hi there, I'm going to talk about my Loop Deck CT, which I've owned for about 10 days. I'm by no means an expert yet, but I've kind of got my head around it. And the reason I'm doing this video is that I think it might help those people who've owned one of these and perhaps couldn't understand it or you're thinking about getting one you're not too sure you've like me watched loads and loads of YouTube videos reviews and so forth so hopefully this will be helpful to you I'm going to timestamp it so you can jump to all the good bits that you want but I am going to do a bit of background uh, before I start full disclosure I'm not being paid by Loop Deck to do this review I bought this with my own hard-earned money so I can be completely honest so those videos I watched, they were pretty evenly split between those people who were in love with this device and those people who found it far too complicated for their needs or they just couldn't get their head around it at all. And when I first picked it up and took it home, the first few days, well initially I thought, oh this is great, I was whizzing about on Final Cut Pro and then I ran into a few problems and I started to get a bit frustrated and I'm guessing that's what happens to a lot of people with it. But I persevered and I'm glad that I did because I've kind of worked through the, the pain barrier and uh, I'm out the other side and I'm beginning to reap the benefits. You're probably looking at me and thinking, why do I need something like this? Well, my day job is teaching musical instruments on YouTube and I spend an awful lot of time editing Final Cut Pro videos and anything that makes my workflow a bit faster has got to be good. And just before Christmas, my son came over from the Canary Islands and he had in his travel bag a stream deck. When I first saw it I was a bit skeptical. Once he'd shown me what it actually did I thought yes this is a great thing to have. So I bought one of the 32 button uh, devices. You know what it's like when you start watching videos on something you own other devices start cropping up and the Loop Deck CT was one of those devices and I started getting very interested in it. I always research things thoroughly before I buy them but you're never quite sure are you until you get hold of them. Now there is an online manual that you can look at and it's okay, you know, there's nothing wrong with it really, but I just found it a bit confusing. I couldn't get my head around it. I often find that hands-on experience is far better than trying to read manuals, plow your way through pages and pages of instructions. So hopefully that's what I'm offering here. Hopefully this might get you over that initial hump. Like I said, Final Cut Pro is my app that I use more than any other. The other app that I use a lot is called Notion and it's made by PreSonus and it's music score writing software and I had to construct a profile for Notion because obviously it's not baked into the Loop Deck CT device because it's not something that a lot of people use. That was quite an interesting process and it taught me an awful lot about the device. So what you have to decide when you're going to buy this is the kind of cost versus the usability and they do cost a fair amount currently in the UK from Amazon they're £469 which is a you know a fair chunk of money to to lay out so you really have to be serious about it before you uh, you get one so what is it what's it for why why do you need one well prior to owning this and the stream deck I did all my inputting if you like on my keyboard and my trackpad and before that a mouse in the standard way. What these devices like the Stream Deck and like the Loop Deck do is that they speed up the process where you might have a shortcut of you know shift command n you just press one button on those devices and that is done for you. That's not the only use but it's one of the uses that they can store streams of text. If you have an email or a letter that you send out regularly and you don't want to keep typing the same text, okay you could store it somewhere on your on your computer in a document and copy and paste. These devices store strings of text, I think it's up to about 500 characters on the Stream Deck, not sure how much it is on the Loop Deck, but at a touch of a button uh, that string of text is instantly placed into your document. So that's a real time saver. There are lots of other uses for it and we'll get to those in the fullness of time. So having said all that, there's nothing you can't do with a keyboard and a mouse and a trackpad that you can do on the Loop Deck CT. Maybe apart from some of the stuff with the dials which is much easier uh, on, on that device. But we'll come to that. Having said all that, 
it's been a lot of fun learning how to use it and it is a, a nice thing to own and use. It's a, it's a beautifully made piece of kit and it definitely responds very well to the touch. So here it is. It looks pretty complicated, doesn't it? Lots of dials and switches and buttons, but they've all got a purpose and there is a, an architecture, there is a hierarchy which I will go through. And you need this piece of software, the Loop Deck Config as it's called, because otherwise uh, you can't make anything happen. So obviously you download that. I won't go all through that. I'm sure you're familiar with downloading bits of software to get things up and running. And there are other videos that show that. I'm using a, a MacBook Pro, a 2014 MacBook Pro, so a fairly old computer, but it works fine with it. So if you look at the software and then you look at the actual device, you can see it's exactly the same, isn't it? So that really simplifies things for you. So whatever you do on the screen will be reflected on the actual device itself. Let's deal with some of the jargon. The profile is the sum of everything you can see here. This setup here on the loop deck is the profile. All the buttons, the way they are assigned, all the switches, all the dials, the knobs, that is the profile. And the profile you're looking at here is for, as you can see up here, Final Cut Pro. It's actually Final Cut Pro 10, of course, which is what I think most people use these days. That's your kind of top tier. So then, of course, you start programming uh, your buttons. And the first things you program are these round buttons, as they're called, and there are eight of them. These green ones have been programmed, and these three over here haven't. These round buttons here, these eight round buttons here, they house your workspaces, and the workspace is the kind of next tier down. So what is a workspace? Well, let's hover over this one, and it says editing. And that's what you can see on this screen here. On the actual screen over here, you can see it's the same thing. And each one of these is a button that can be pressed. It's actually not a physical button. This is all part of one big touch screen, which is sectioned off, and you just touch it. And if I just press this one here, project, you may have heard a funny little noise there, which is the little buzz and you get haptic feedback. There's a kind of a little motor in there, which gives you a little vibration to let you know that you've touched the button and made something happen. So each one of these round buttons, these workspaces, houses a set of assignments to the 12 touch buttons on this screen over here and to the six dials over here and some of these buttons these square buttons down here are programmable and of course we have the lovely wheel here which has a, a ring that moves on the outside and we have the inner part of the wheel which is a touch <laughs> surface as well everything is nameable so this one is editing this one is color this one is audio this one, because it's me, I've called it Les Editing. If I click it, this one has got all the things that I use an awful lot in Final Cut Pro. Blade at place, blade all, select transform. Uh, this will take me to a markers page, come back to that, show inspector. This is all my kind of favorites. And this one here, number five. This one, it's just got a couple of uh, buttons assigned play from the beginning and the play around. So the workspaces are your kind of next level down from the profile. And each of these eight buttons can house a workspace. And the good news is if you fill up all of these 12 buttons and all of these six dials and the touch wheel as well, yes, you could use another round button and set up another workspace, but you can have extra pages for each one of these workspaces. For instance, this one here, if I go to my Les Editing, you can see there's one, two, three different pages here. Now, you can't see that on the actual device. You see there's nothing below there with that dial, but it is on the software. And if I just hover over this, this is Les Main Page. If I hover over the two, markers, three, compound clips, and how do I get to see those? Well, on the software, I just click the button and it takes me to them. And it's moving over on my actual device as well. On the actual device itself, you simply swipe across anywhere on the screen to see the extra pages. And once you get to the end and keep swiping, it takes you back to page number one. And you can have an infinite amount of pages for each workspace. So that's brilliant, isn't it? So you're not limited to just 
one setup of touch buttons and dials. You can have loads and loads and loads of them. And the, the thing to do here is to get organized. So that's what I've tried to do here. Um, this is the default Final Cut Pro profile, which I've tweaked and added to. But, you know, obviously I've tried to keep it organized. The first one here, this editing screen is one that was in the device when I got it for Final Cut Pro and it's pretty well sorted out. These purple buttons up here are just single assignments. So you can delete with this button, you can disable or enable a clip with this button. These buttons up here with the blue top and bottom, they take you to other pages. If I click this button here, it doesn't take me uh, to that other page, either on the software or on the actual device. But if I do it on the actual device itself, here we go, project, and it's taken me to another page. And then if I hit this one, edit basics, it will take me back. These are navigational buttons. If I hit tools, this is another page, and there's some tools there, you see? But at any time you can come back to the round buttons to go to your, uh, but you can't, oh, it's crashed. Now you see, this is a problem, right? Just by doing what I've just been doing, I've crashed the software, so the thing's frozen. So the software's crashed, which is not great, is it? So I've got to uh, close the window. Can I get it back? Open loop deck. And yes, it's rebooted. So this is a problem and I don't know why it's crashing. Uh, I installed it very carefully and, and did all the things that I'm supposed to do in the system preferences, but it doesn't happen often, but it is a nuisance when it does. One really good use of these buttons is to use them to navigate to other pages. So if I go to the navigational page over here and I click the transport button here, this is a workspace, and drag that over here. Now if I click that button, it takes me back to my uh, transport workspace. You see, so you can put navigational buttons uh, within pages. So you need to be methodical about the way you use your workspaces. And like I say, I have been with Final Cut here and I've got all these workspaces set out, these round buttons set out with the various things that I use a lot. And obviously on this one here, I've only used two of the buttons. All these are ready to be populated, as they say. And you can not only program these buttons, you can program the dials. And you can see over here what those dials are actually doing. So this one here is operating the volume, this dial operates the clip height, this is the zoom, and this zoom function is worth the admission price on its own. If I show you on Final Cut itself, so here's one of my Melodian videos, and if I just turn this dial, and you can see, that is brilliant, isn't it? To be able to zoom in and out like that is something you could have only dreamt about a few years ago. This is just brilliant, instant, so that's great. And the clip height, see how you can do that? Isn't that wonderful? With these touch buttons, you have these extra pages, and you can have extra pages with the dials as well. So if we look at, uh, let's find one that's got that. Each workspace can have, look at this one here. This one's got six sets of dials. So this is in the color correction workspace, this is, one, remember these are the dials, I look at two, these have changed to shadows, uh, this has changed to mid, saturation, so I've got six pages, that one's empty, you can have pages and pages of assignments for the dials, which are completely independent, this uh, workspace has got four pages of buttons and six pages of dials, you see, so you're not confined just to what you actually see, and of course these, you can swipe this way, see? You actually swipe the screen that way to get the other assignments of the dials. Isn't that brilliant? Fantastic. And the same for the wheel. Now the wheel, if I just click it, has got five pages, see? Page one, global color wheel, page two, shadows wheel, page three, midtones wheel, and this is just on the uh, color correction workspace. You know, so you can have another complete set of assignments for the, the wheel on other workspaces. 
If you get your head around the architecture of this thing, it's absolutely brilliant, but it is confusing at first. A week ago, I was practically tearing, well, I'd say tear my hair out, but I haven't got any left, but you know, I was, I was going a bit nuts trying to sort this out. But having sorted it out, you know, I had one of those eureka moments, thought, yes, this thing is amazing. And you can see why, can't you? Talking of color correction, let's go to workspace two. If I press this button that says color wheels, and you'll see that they've appeared on the screen over here. And if I just turn the dial uh, on, let's say, what should we do? Shadows wheel, press that button. And if you look at the dial, it goes up and down. See, and you can see uh, how that's changing the shadows on the screen. I'm getting the, the blacks really black. If I press the highlights wheel and over there, you can see that on the screen there, on the actual uh, monitor, you can see the highlights are changing. This is the brilliant thing. If you just put your finger in the middle of the wheel and move over to the left, you can see how the dot on the wheel on the monitor is moving over, so changing the, the highlights there. See? So, and you can do that for all the wheels. I mean, I'm literally just scratching the surface here, but you can see what, you know, you can do with this thing, it's amazing. So you have to decide the right way to organize this thing for yourself. I mean, you can either have a different workspace for every thing that you want within this piece of software, or you could have uh, one workspace with loads of uh, extra pages, all related. It's entirely up to you how you organize it. I haven't mentioned this yet, and I haven't used this myself yet, but with the function button here, it says activate FN layer. You can have another set of assignments for all these eight buttons, and therefore you can have a double the workspaces and then obviously, you know, infinite amount of extra pages. It really is pretty limitless. So these buttons I've explained, you just touch them, you get the haptic feedback and you know that you've pressed them. Uh, these are dials that turn and they also have a, a press function. The way you use these normally is you rotate a value with the dial and you press the button on top to reset it, but that's not the only use. Uh, you can use these press buttons on top of the dials in the same way that you can use the touch buttons because you can't label them on the actual device. You can only label them in the software. If I go to the software, uh, you'll see how it, these are labeled, right? You can't see any labels uh, on these, but if you click them, then you can see that this one is change edit on the dial and select clip at playhead on the press. So, um, you know, there's two assignments in one there for that, that dial. This one up here is change marker uh, on the dial and add marker on the press on that same button. It's brilliant, isn't it? I mean, I think you're probably beginning to see now that it's an amazing piece of kit. These buttons down here have limited programmability. These here, A, B, C, D, and E, you can program those. You can see that it says no action assigned. This one here, that's a down arrow, that's an up arrow, that's a jump to previous frame, jump to next frame. So these have been assigned, so you can use them in the normal way. This little green circle here, this is the home button. So if you press that at any time, I'll do it on the actual device, it takes you back to your home page and here on this home page you can see all the workspaces laid out so if i press number three it will take me to my audio workspace which is assigned to number three which i think is lit a little bit brighter than the others undo is well undo changes that's been assigned and you can have a second layer for these buttons you see and if you hold the uh, function button down and press that it will redo the changes so, you know, these have got two layers with the function button. From what you can see on this button here, you can see it's the enter button. And if you hold function down and press it, it's an escape button. So two functions under one there. The amount of programmability for this thing is absolutely amazing, isn't it? And of course, you can see you've got a lovely clock in the middle. Rather strangely, the clock doesn't show the right time on the software, but on the actual device, it does, and you've got a second hand as well. 
my message to you if you've got one of these things is name everything because it just defaults to you know touch page one touch button one or something which is not much help but you can name everything and I'll show you that because I'm going to build a profile from the ground up for you just give you a quick look around the software here up here on the left it just shows you the device you've got I've got a loop deck CT there's a loop deck live which is the same but doesn't have the lower part uh, doesn't have the, the wheel and those extra buttons but essentially it's the same in the middle here you've got all the profiles that are baked into the machine or the ones you've made you see I've got one here for Notion I'll show you that one which is quite a good one quite proud of this one uh, so you can see I've got all these lovely note icons I can input crotchets and quavers and minims I've got other pages there where I can do repeat signs and tempos and key signatures so I'll just give you a very quick example of that if I just boot up uh, Notion so in this bar here if I want to put a crotchet in here I've got a crotchet icon here if I just press that you see it's come up on the screen and I can move it around and put it wherever I want if I want to do a sharp press that and I can put it by the note and that note now is D sharp you see so it's brilliant isn't it and over here I've got these things I can put a uh, repeat sign here this one here rolls through various repeat signs ending one so having got that on the screen just position it where I want it like that and I can put lyrics in and text in so you see it's fantastic a notion it's a not very well known piece of software but if you're a musician and you use musical notation I really recommend it I know a lot of people use Sibelius but I love notion it's great Let's go back to our loop deck software. Sorry, this is quite a long video. I wasn't expecting it to be as long as this, but you know, with the timestamps, you can see the bits you want. So let's go to this middle menu here. It's all about the profiles. So Ableton Live, you've got After Effects, Final Cut, Illustrator, Note, Notions, one I've done, Pages is one I've done, Reason is one I've done, uh, Screenflow is baked in, and you can find more app profiles. Click there, it takes you online and you can see all the other profiles that are available okay I won't go into that it's been done in other videos and you can import profiles if you've downloaded something off the net and rather more importantly if I go to Notion here and get this ellipsis menu up if I click that and I click over here it's a little bit hard to find another ellipsis you can see I can export this profile in other words I can back it up to somewhere on my computer so if something goes wrong I can back it up and I can re-import it in the future which is great isn't it I can rename the profile there as well this naming thing is is key to success with this thing the Mac OS default that's the profile for the computer where you can see you've got things like screen capture uh, spotlight lock the screen the finder on this page here you can go to YouTube you've got the clock a knowledge base for loop deck all kinds of stuff all your emojis are there so this is kind of your basic profile you've got a calculator there <laughs> brilliant and each one of those I could do a video on but I won't bore you to death with it but you know once you've got it you'll see so that is your Mac OS default profile and then of course you can have these other ones here if the dynamic mode is on then when you go to a piece of software on your computer then the loop deck jumps straight to that so if I go to uh, Final Cut then my loop deck is showing Final Cut uh, if I go back to that loop deck software loop deck if I turn that off if I change to another app like Sound Studio Sound Studio has come up on my computer but it hasn't gone to my Sound Studio profile on my loop deck so I think it's probably worth keeping that on the whole time. If dynamic mode is on, it means that your loop deck device follows what you do on your computer in terms of booting up uh, apps. So that's that. Over here, these are your workspaces. So if I go to Final Cut, in the workspace menu here, you can see all the workspaces that have been created. Editing, color, audio, home. They haven't all been used maybe, but they're all available if you want. You can make a new one there. Which leads me neatly to the right hand side I'm using the the new UE or user interface there is a classic one and a small criticism here at the time of doing this video is that all the stuff you look at online from Loop Tech uh, shows the classic user interface which is completely different to this I actually prefer this new one but you can go to the classic 
uh, interface here just by pressing this button. I'm not going to do that for the moment. Here you've got a load of menus, uh, Final Cut. This gives you a load of commands that you can drag to buttons. So if you want to make this dial here change colour wheel, you simply drag it over to it like this and drop it and then it becomes change colour wheel. I'll undo that. So I don't want to do that. And you've got shortcuts to various things. All these things over here are commands, assignments that you can drag over to buttons or dials or to the wheel. That's the whole point of it. Uh, the OS here gives you all the desktop actions, so things on the clipboard. Everything you see here that's got a little hand with a pressing action on it can be dragged to a button or a dial, the top of the dial, press button, action of the dial. These are all assignments you can have. This is the navigation menu. It shows you all of the workspaces available for this actual profile. And these can all be dragged to the buttons over here. These are all the touch pages that have been put together for this profile so far. And over here, the device navigation, let's scroll down, you can drag these over to buttons. So you can press a button to go back, you can press a button to, to take you to the next dial page. There's all ways of getting around the device. It's you know a, a pretty full on thing, isn't it? And I could probably make a two hour video here and this is probably gonna be pretty long as it is. And I do apologize, it's going on a bit, but hopefully you're staying with me and you're finding it interesting. And there's other menus over here for creating uh, custom actions. Sometimes you may not find something in those other menus that's uh, gonna work for you so you can make your own ones up. And you can see that I've made a few up here, play around and play around new. I've done those for Final Cut. And then you've got other menus, things like Twitch, Philips, uh, Hue, which is for controlling lighting, um, and Spotify, which I don't have, and OBS, which I don't use because I'm not a streamer. So I'm sure you've probably guessed by now. Right, so what I think I'll do now is I will create a profile from scratch I've already created a profile for my Sound Studio app. What I'm going to do, I'm going to create another one from scratch so you can see how it works. So I'm going to go up to this menu here and I'm going to come down to Sound Studio Default, click the ellipsis menu, add another profile. We'll call this Sound. Studio 2, press OK. Now you can see, if I close this, I've got just one button populated here with the clock. If I click the ellipsis menu and press unassign, I've now got a blank canvas to work from. So none of my workspaces are populated, none of my buttons or dials, the whole thing is a, like I say, a blank canvas. It's a very good idea to have all of your shortcuts ready so if I boot up Sound Studio, which I've got here, and I've got a help, and Sound Studio help, and go to keyboard shortcuts, there's a list of all the shortcuts, and they're gonna come in handy. I've actually typed them into my iPad for quick reference, but that's a really good idea to have that ready to go when you're building a profile. So that's what Sound Studio looks like. It's just a very basic uh, audio app, which I use an awful lot, I have done ever since I went over to Mac. Uh, in about 2003. Workspace 1 has already been made up here. So if I look over here in the navigation under Workspaces, Workspace 1 is there. I'm going to change the name a bit because I don't like that. I'm going to modify it. I'm just going to drag across that, press Delete, make a new workspace. Let's call this Transport. OK, press OK. Right, now we have a transport workspace and it's over here on the right hand side under the navigation menu. It's not assigned to any of my eight round buttons so I'm going to get hold of it and drag it across and dump it on number one here. Now that's lit green and if I just hover over it it should say transport and it does. So that's my first workspace assigned. Nothing in it of course. No buttons or dials or touch wheel but for the moment that's the start. Right. I haven't finished naming because if I look here, if I if I go over here to the ellipsis next to the one and click it, it just says touch page one. Let's just say for sake of argument, I'm going to have several pages of uh, transport commands. I'm going to change this 
in the ellipsis menu, rename, and I'm going to call this Transport 1. Okay, press return. Now, this workspace is called Transport, but the page, the first page, this one here, is called Transport 1. Right, so I've got a workspace uh, named and the first page named. Okay, so that's good. So I can now start putting things onto these buttons that I'm going to use. So let's put play, that's a, a standard command on this button here. Now I know it's the space bar that starts and stops the uh, app. So if I click here and go to shortcut out of this menu, okay, click that. And over here it says new shortcut action. Going to drag across that, call it play. Over here, I'm going to record the shortcut. I'm literally going to press space on my computer. Now it says space in that shortcut, and that's done. Now it's already assigned to that button because I went from this menu, but I could have I could have put it together over here and dragged it across. And if I don't like it on this button, I can just drag it to another one. You see? But I'm going to put it back where it was. Right, so just to prove it's working, let's go back to Sound Studio. I know this is very basic, and I'm just going to press this button here. It says play. It's working. And again, and it stops. Obviously, I could just press the space bar on my computer, and this is, you know, a big argument. Is it worth all that when you know you can just press the space bar on your keyboard? And that's a, a good point, isn't it? But just showing you that you can put these things together it's a very basic command and so you can go ahead and build more and more buttons I've done play and record in my other profile in fact let's just jump to that just to save time Let's go back to our default one. So this is, as we used to say, one I did earlier and I've done play, stop, rewind, fast forward, record, pause, back to start on this workspace. So basically you make your workspace up here, okay? And then each button you can assign a macro, that's several buttons pressed one after the other, or a shortcut or run, means you can run an application with a document in it, uh, go to a web page. You can trigger a sound, you can trigger a string of text, that kind of thing. So you can build your own profiles. You're not stuck with the ones that are baked into the device when you buy it. So to sum up, I barely scratched the surface for this thing, but I'm beginning to get my head around it. I do have a few reservations about the software. I don't like the fact that it crashes from time to time. And some things sometimes don't seem to work, but it might be me. So I'm going to reserve judgment on that and hopefully there'll be updates. There have been quite a few so far, I think we're up to uh, version 5 something or other. So obviously they're, they're working on it. It's been out a couple of years as I uh, record this video, so I'm sure it's still a work in progress. So there we are. There's probably a few things that I've missed in this video. There's some things I haven't discovered yet, I'm sure. And it's exciting when you're learning a piece of kit like this and you come across something you didn't know before. And I've watched a lot of videos. I've read a lot of stuff online about it. Uh, but I'm sure there's still a way to go. But anyway, I hope you found it useful and interesting. My initial reaction, having owned this for about 10 days, is that it's going to be something, and it already is something, that's very, very useful. You have to invest a bit of time in it. Luckily, I'm kind of semi-retired, so I've got the time. If you were a busy working person, it might be a bit of a problem. You'd have to set aside some time after work to uh, do the programming. But once things are set up on it, I have found that it is enormously useful. If you want to know any more, you can get in touch with me uh, either on my website or, or via my YouTube channel. But in any case, thank you very much for watching and you'll see me in my next video.